Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey everyone, if you missed the announcement podcast yesterday, this marks the final episode in The Realignment's near daily episode update on the Ukraine conflict following Russia's invasion of the country. And I got to say, I woke up yesterday and I was just absolutely exhausted. I taped something for breaking points. I did a couple of podcasts for next week and I just was like, look, I can't do this anymore. Uh, not to say the conflict is over, but I think that we've covered this as well as we could in the past month. And while there's a lot more to say, we'll be saying it along a more regular cadence rather than every single day so that the quality could bump up and we don't just have to start you know, putting stuff out there kind of randomly. With all that said, huge thank you to everyone who's tuned in during the series. I thought about this yesterday, but we've literally doubled the amount of unique listeners we have, downloads are through the roof, and this has given us so many different avenues to expand and go into for the show. So a quick request for everyone, number one, please, and people have been doing this so far already, so I really appreciate it, send in your thoughts around the following topics. One, the number of episodes we should do a week. I am not going to be able to do five episodes a week. But I definitely think we could do more than one. And we're definitely interested in exploring alternate formats like the discussion episodes between me and Sagar. So email us at realignmentpod at gmail.com if you have any ideas for how we should be putting this out cadence-wise, but how we should explore different formats. Two, we are going to start monetizing the show. Part of the reason why we need to actually take a bit of a break in terms of these daily episodes, but also think about formats is we actually need to be able to support the work that we're doing here. So expect an announcement, hopefully tomorrow on Friday, the 8th around uh, monetization via Supercast, which is what Sagar Crystal used very via breaking points. If you have any thoughts on how we should monetize, what prices make sense, paywalls, additional features, all those bits, definitely let us know. We definitely don't want this to be a walled off show. We think that when we do more content, we want to have this actually go out to folks. So the way we can actually accomplish that is we actually have the unit economics make more sense there. We're also thinking about advertising too, but what we'll probably end up doing is just doing the whole strategy of let's see how well we could support the show of subscribers. And if it turns out that there's still more to do, we would turn on ads, but we'll give it a bit of time to see how we actually end up doing that. Now to the actual episode. This is definitely the most abstract episode of any ones that we're doing um, as part of this series. Sagar and I have made a bunch of references to JFK and a book we read about him, which is called JFK, Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917 to 1956. And the book is written by today's guest, uh, Professor Frederick Logoval. Uh, who's a professor at Harvard University. And basically, the reason why I wanted to interview Fred and the reason why Sagar and I talked about this book so much during the discussion section is as soon as this invasion started and as soon as it became clear that this is going to be such a defining moment for America and the world, the future in Europe, Cold War II with China, and even our domestic economy when it comes to the energy and supply chain issues, it became clear that it'd be really useful to read a book that's kind of taking you a step back and to help you understand what it's like to be, frankly, a young person with no real power and to think about the world next week goes about. So the reason why this book is so interesting in that context is JFK coming of age in the American century really deals with the first part of JFK's life. It's part of a two-volume biography. And most people, if they thought about JFK during this conflict, they almost certainly thought about the Cuban Missile Crisis. But as you will discover in this conversation and you will discover in the actual book, I hope you all purchase it, we cannot recommend it enough. JFK was actually as a Harvard senior, he's around 21, 22 years old, before PT-109, before World War II, he was actually present in Europe during the lead up to World War II because his father, Joseph P. Kennedy, was actually the U.S. ambassador to Great Britain. So he is a figure, JFK, who is writing, is thinking, is developing, and all of his travels, all of his investigations led him to write a book, Why England Slept, that came out in 1940. So what's so interesting there is this really reflects upon the fact that there are moments when history is happening that even if you're a young person, even if you don't have any direct power, you are capable of looking at the world and thinking about it. So much feedback from the audience is focused on this idea of, well, I'm young, I'm not an expert, I don't really have anything to say. And as Fred and I get into during this episode, JFK really was in the position that many of you all 
and myself especially have been in the past month. So thinking about how this very, very, very important historical figure, JFK, thought about these issues when he was the age of most people in this audience is so helpful and it's very interesting. The other thing to highlight too, though, and it speaks to why I'm interested in this topic, is the JFK book is actually structured around the Kennedy family, but not in the conventional sense. So uh, RFK, um, JFK's younger Bobby, is far too young. Ted Kennedy is also too young too, so they don't factor into the story. Instead, my conversation with Fred is going to focus on how JFK, his father, Joseph P. Kennedy, and JFK's older brother, who is oft forgotten, uh, Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., actually responded to the lead up to World War II. Uh, Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. was actually killed during World War II in 1944. But what's so interesting here is that all three figures in this conversation really took different approaches to this lead up to the war and actually when the war happened. So JFK becomes much more of an internationalist. Uh, Joseph P. Kennedy eventually has to effectively be run out of the job as ambassador to Great Britain because he's seen as too much of a appeaser when it comes to the relationship between the United States, the UK, and Nazi Germany. And then Joseph E. Kennedy Jr. really follows his father's footsteps into isolationism, despite when Pearl Harbor happening, him instantly joining the war effort and eventually going on to sacrifice his life for the cause. So the broad way I think about this episode is I would really think about how the story of JFK and his family in the 30s and early 40s demonstrates how different people, even in the same family union, even with the same relationships, could respond to moments in history in different ways. And then hopefully the point of why England slept could come out and really focus on how do you actually make good decisions? How do you evaluate the world? And how do you as a young person probably who may still be in college, who may be even an intern or a recent grad, how do you really contribute and develop thoughts around events when they happen? It's a really long one, but I really wanted to contextualize this episode and make it clear this isn't just a random conversation on history. It's actually the first book that Sagar and I both turned to after the invasion started. All that said, huge thank you to everyone in the audience. Huge thank you to Lincoln Ever for supporting our work. Quick reminder, you can find the links to send us a tip, uh, to subscribe to our Substack, which will be coming out tomorrow in a special edition. And finally, a uh, link to the bookshop where you can purchase JFK Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917 to 1956. For all that, hope you enjoyed this episode. It meant a lot to me and would love to hear your thoughts. Dr. Fred Logoval, welcome to The Realignment. Delighted to be with you. Yeah, excited to speak with you. So listeners know that I've been doing a lot of reading, a lot of studying, putting out these daily episodes for about the past month. But the first book I turned to, which I originally had listened on Audible when it came out in September 2020, but I actually just reread in paper copy was your book, JFK. Volume One, Growing Up in the, um, which is focused on him in the American century up to 1956. So I'd love for you just to really set the table and really just articulate why you decided to write about JFK in this specific period of his life and why you think there could be resonance with maybe the times we're in now and how younger persons especially are thinking of this moment. Yeah, well, I'm delighted to be with you. As I said, it's it's really good to have uh, you to have me on. I I am. Um... You know, I undertook this in part because uh, he's an interesting figure to me, and I think a highly consequential figure in the 20th century. And I had this idea that even though we have literally thousands of books on, on, on this political figure, we didn't really have what I consider to be a kind of comprehensive biography, one that, that used the mass of material that we now have available, which is magnificent. Uh, and really look at in particular maybe his formative years that made him who he was if we're going to peel away the mythology of jfk it seems to me we've got to look at him before he became before he became jfk the man known all around the world by his middle initials and so that's the the basic answer to your first question i thought we there was a need for this uh and i also had a um there's a conceit in the book, as you'll recall, maybe from the preface. And the idea is, Marshall, that you can actually understand not just JFK better if you contextualize his life, but you can understand the times better. So by using Kennedy as a kind of lens, we actually come to comprehend more fully key developments in both American history in the middle decades of the 20th century, uh, and in world history. And I think he is that kind of a figure. It's, it's 
there was great fun in that regard to write the first volume. And I think very quickly, we can come back to your second point, which is a really good one. Um, I think, you know, he's an inspirational figure. And I think what he learned from his parents, and I think from his teachers, was that one has to believe in something greater than oneself. Uh, and so in his famous words in his inaugural address, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That was a message that I think he had um, digested long before he became president. I think it drove him into public service. I think that's a message uh, for today that that ought to resonate. Uh, it certainly resonates with me. And let's really just introduce JFK, because as you were talking about with introducing a specific vision of him, I would say most even listeners who are interested in American history, their image of JFK would probably start with PT 109. Yeah. So, oh, JFK, he becomes famous because he saves his crew. There's this big article, and that's just the image. Then moving forward, he gets elected to Congress, becomes a senator, becomes um, the youngest elected president. But the key thing about the period I want to focus on in this book is JFK in the 1930s going into the 40s, which I think, frankly, is the most interesting version of JFK to me, because it's, aside from a lot of version of JFK we think about often, it's saying, wow, here's this young person who's actually very, very, very smart. Um, you, you you cite his, his his writings, and obviously he isn't the greatest with syntax, and you know he could have used an editor in certain respects. But I was just struck by wow, if I met this person, I interview a lot of people for this. This would be one of the smartest people, aside from just his age, I'd actually have spoken to. So can you just introduce him as a character in this context? Yeah, I mean he's 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 in some ways pretty typical, let's say when he is at Choate, where he, which is where he went to prep school, and even in his first couple of years at Harvard. Um, not a particularly um, exceptional student, in fact, in fact, pretty ordinary, didn't really apply himself, a little bit of a slacker. But what's interesting about him is that even at Choate, and certainly when he got here to Harvard, just a few feet where I'm sitting, uh, from, from where I'm sitting today, um, professors could see that this is a guy who, if he implied himself, um, really could be something really substantial. Uh, and that was said not just in hindsight after he became famous, uh, but even at the time when we look at his um, grade reports and the, the feedback that he got from faculty members, both at Choate and at Harvard. And what's interesting about him is he, he's got a, a kind of intellectual curiosity about the world. This is something he got, I think, substantially from his mother, who often doesn't get enough credit, I think, in treatments of young JFK, because the father, who is really important, and I'm sure we'll discuss him, he's such a dominant figure that Rose, the mom, is kind of shunted aside. But I think it was from Rose that he got a a deep interest in history, for example deep interest in biography. He read a ton as a kid, partly because he was sick a lot. Um, Developed that interest from her and also a kind of international sensibility that I I write about, which develops right in this period, in the 30s. Wants to know about the world, travels around the world. You know, he's right there in Berlin on the eve of World War II. He's almost a kind of... uh, I don't know, Forrest Gump type figure in the sense that he happens to be in all these places where amazing things are happening. And he takes it all in quietly, I think stores it away. But the end result is that by the end of the decade, so now World War I in Europe has begun. His father is ambassador to Britain. He's writing a senior thesis at Harvard that becomes his first book. I think now what we see is somebody who's beginning to be much more serious about all this and thinking about his own place in this rapidly changing world, uh, wondering what his contribution will be, also separating from his, from his we should talk about this, separating from his father yep. in terms of their respective positions on what the United States should be doing. This was totally fascinating to research and to write. This part of the book 
um, I said to my wife more than once, I could do a whole book on the Kennedys at war. You know, in other words, the father in Britain as ambassador and as an isolationist, and the two oldest sons serving in the war, sisters are involved in the war effort. It's a, it's a remarkable story. So yeah, so let's, let's set the table then. I want to focus first on the three characters I'm interested in speaking about. So Joseph Patrick Kennedy, the father, obviously, yeah. Joseph Patrick Kennedy Jr., his brother, and then obviously JFK. So, and then we'll get into the specific times they're living in, because this has been a recurring pattern over people thinking about this era the past month. But the thing I really want to make clear, and I want to pick up the point you made around the Kennedys at war here, the reason why this story is interesting beyond just JFK being interesting is this fact that within one family, basically all of the debates of the era are going down. The, the question of generational legacy, questions of like, so for example, appeasement isn't merely just like a hypothetical term that could be thrown around. It actually deeply matters in this context. And seeing how JFK's older brother goes a different direction, he goes one direction. Obviously, um, Joseph Patrick Kennedy Jr. dies during World War II. There's really so much there. So introduce the characters, starting with Joseph Patrick Kennedy. Yeah, well, so so Joe Kennedy Sr. Um, uh, has become, during the course of the 1920s, when Joe Jr. and Jack and their siblings are small, he has become one of America's wealthiest men. Um, and that's a story that I also tell, um, and of course has been covered also by others. Um, a ruthless, very skilled operator, uh, especially on Wall Street, uh, and who feels, and this is an important subtext, he feels marginalized to a degree in Boston Brahmin society. Uh, he went to Harvard, uh, so he's privileged in that sense. He's made a ton of money, but still feels slighted um, because of his Catholicism. And I think it fuels him in the 1930s. And he becomes, as he realizes that the 1930s are going to be the, the decade of government as opposed to the 20s, decade of, of, of business and of making money, uh, he shifts his own ambition I think wants to become president himself, but in the near term, works very hard to become part of the, uh, of the Roosevelt administration, doesn't get treasury, which is what he wants to be treasury secretary, but he does get the ambassadorship in London. And so in 38 to 40, Joe Kennedy, a very well-known figure already, uh, uh, I think it's fair to say, and a hero to many, <clears throat> to many in Catholic Boston, becomes becomes ambassador just at a point when Jack and Joe Jr. are at Harvard. Uh, Joe Jr. is the older one. He's the oldest of the nine kids. He's class of 1938. Jack is class of 1940. Uh, and he's a very dominant figure, Joe Kennedy. But he's also a very devoted father. So I give a, a kind of a mixed picture of him, as you know, in the book, because he is somebody who cares deeply for his kids, boys and girls, or nine kids total. Um, so that's a little uh, snapshot of him and his oldest son. And I want to I want to just pick up a couple yeah. a couple of points here because I think this history sure. is new to a lot of folks. So a, who were the Boston Brahmins? Because this is a term which yeah. means basically nothing. Oh. today in terms of the way America is structured. So introduce that term and I'll go over a couple other things then we'll get to Joe Jr. Yeah, so yeah, you're right. I should, I should, I should elaborate on that. I, I, it's, it is the subset of uh, Boston society that controls um, uh, the financial uh, sector, uh, education, uh, cultural um, the cultural scene in Boston, it is made up of people in many cases who are from a long lineage of um, uh, Harvard men. Um, and it is a group that is uh, by, by the standards of the day, very distinguished uh, and deep roots in New England, uh, a sort of aristocratic, maybe that's a word that resonates more with, with, with today's audiences, a kind of aristocracy that is very much dominant, including at Harvard. And so when Joe Sr. is at Harvard around the turn of the last century, he feels this acutely that he's not eligible, for example, 
for the elite final clubs at Harvard because he's Irish, he's Catholic, doesn't matter what he does. And he works very hard to gain admission to one of the clubs, doesn't do it. So that in a microcosm is what excludes, what fuels his sense of grievance about his place. Doesn't matter how much money he makes, he's never going to be accepted to these people. And the second thing I wanted to get into, because it's when you say he's a he's a business operator, I think it's going it, to, to a certain degree, it glosses over just how interesting no. the person this was. So it's not merely that he's on Wall Street, but he no. helps build Hollywood. He yeah. is the first SEC chairman. So can you just, so because I think what's, what's fascinating here is that he is a very wealthy person yeah. who's also hyper competent yeah. up until the story we're about to get into. Yeah. So can you just can you just speak to this part of him? Yeah. Well, it's 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 a, it is a fascinating story, and and David Nassau in his biography, um, the Patriarch, uh, I think covers the rise of Joe Kennedy really well. Others have written about it too, but you're quite right. Uh, he has a knack for making money, and by the way, I'll just say here parenthetically, his second son has no interest in making money, has no interest in following in dad's footsteps. This is the sort of thing that bores the heck out of, of, of Jack. But he has a knack for making money, using means on Wall Street that today would be considered uh, illegal, that were even at the time sort of, of dubious uh, ethics, um, but they were legal uh, and uh, you know, using stock tips to, 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 to to, to buy and sell, uh, short selling, uh, other, um, other means that he used. But then what's so interesting, as you point out, is that he decides, you know what? Movies are a big thing. They're going to take over. I want in on this action. And so he actually begins to spend more and more time in the middle 1920s in Hollywood, which is just beginning to take off. Um, and he becomes immersed in this business once again, shows himself to be really savvy about this, makes a lot of money in Hollywood, also learns lessons that I think become important for, for, for Jack later on, which is the importance of image, the importance of PR, um, how to present, how to be comfortable in front of a camera is something he wants all his kids to be. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, as, as Roosevelt takes office, Joe Kennedy wants to be involved. And as you say, he becomes um, SEC chairman. Uh, and the joke was, the, you know, use a thief, uh, use a thief to, to catch a thief because they, he already had a reputation for being somewhat unethical. But Kennedy said, or FDR said, well, that's precisely why we should have him in this role as Wall Street's top cop, because he knows how to, how to evade the cops, if you will. Yeah, so then... And one more idea, we're spending a lot of time on Joseph Patrick Sr., but I think he's such an interesting person, it's worth minding. This idea that he, once again, goes to Wall Street, goes to Hollywood, he's essentially ahead of the curve. And like you said, he says, government is the future. Can you go, can you go into his thinking there? Because that shapes the way he pushed his sons especially. Yeah. He's not saying, hey, you're going to take over the family business. He kind of farms that off to the second tier um, husbands of his daughters in a certain way. But just so, so speak to this idea of yeah. government is the future in the 30s, the New Deal, all of that part. Yeah. Well, I think it, it, it comes out of this conviction on his part comes out of the Wall Street crash. He had actually handled even that part brilliantly in that he had sold off a lot prior to the crash. He sensed that the market was overheated um, and came out of that crash in really good shape. And in fact, in the, in the early years of the depression, Joe Kennedy's fortune actually grows substantially. He becomes more and more wealthy. So it's not that this has touched him personally, but what, but I, what I think he determines, and I, I think he was right about this, was that because of the depression, and the degree to which millions of Americans were now hurting deeply, uh, whoever became president, even if, if, if FDR had not won in 1932, whoever was in, in the White House was going to have a lot of latitude, Joe Kennedy uh, sensed, to do, make fundamental changes to the, to, the, to the American economy, ultimately to American society, 
um, which of course is what happened with the New Deal. And I think Kennedy understood that there were going to be lots of restraints now on business, uh, that this was going to be the decade of, of, of big government, if you will. Uh, and he adjusted it for himself. As I said, he had more ambitions for the White House than people often understand. He really thought, I'm going to be the first Catholic president. If FDR does not run in 1940, so this is when he's now in London, uh, I think I can be the nominee, which I think was a stretch. I don't think he was ever that close to being the nominee, but he believed it. And then transferred his ambitions onto his older, to his two oldest children, Joe Jr. in the first instance, and then Jack. So let's get to Joe Jr., probably the least yeah. known of the three that we're describing today. Yeah, he, um, he was the golden child. Uh, he was the, the child that both Joe Sr. and Rose um, focused their attention on. He was the one who was supposed to go, you know, ultimately to the top, to the presidency. And they were actually thinking in those terms from an early point. He was very handsome, sort of, you know, movie star handsome and very driven, um, a hard charging kind of personality. Uh, and Jack grew up very much in his shadow. They're about, they're, uh, about two years apart in age. Um, and uh, Joe Jr., he became almost a kind of surrogate father because Joe Sr. was gone so much, including in Hollywood and with mistresses. Um, Joe Jr., often with the nine, the eight younger children, younger than himself, became a kind of second father figure. So he had that kind of responsibility, um, very driven. What's interesting about him, lots of things are interesting about Joe Jr., including the rivalry with Jack, which we can get to. But he was not willing to separate himself from his father. So he parroted his father's views on world politics, uh, on domestic politics, um, on kind of a, a kind of world philosophy, if you will. He was very much under his father, wanted to remain under his father really until his dying day. He died in 1944 on almost a kind of suicide mission in the war, in the European theater. Uh, and his parents, on some level, I think they never quite recovered from the death of Joe Jr. because um, because of their ambitions for him, their hopes for him, uh, their deep, deep affection for uh, for Joe Jr. And this is something which you kind of, this is explicit and implicit in it. I'm just giving notes for folks who, you know, go on to read and study this period. It's not clear to me that Joe Jr. would have been a good politician at all. And actually, when he engages in politics, yeah. he's actually bad at it. In the sense, and this speaks to the problem that his father had too, in the sense that they made very bad strategic miscalculations. So for example, in 1940 at the Democratic National Convention where Joe Jr. is a delegate, doesn't he, doesn't he essentially vote against FDR, if, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering correctly? Which is which which why would you yeah. why would you do that? And this is yeah. I think I believe when his was his father still ambassador at that point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's so, still he's so, still so, the ambassador. So it's, so that's that's just the fascinating contradiction here because you, you really realize that this is a person who on paper should be president, to your point. Yeah. Handsome, healthy, unlike Jack, um, goes to LSE, is at Harvard Law School, goes on to be an airman in the Navy. Yet when it actually comes down to it, as with his father, who's very impressive as well, too, they just consistently make bad choices when it comes to their own personal decisions. So can you just speak to... The, the gap, yeah. the, the yeah. gap between one's competence and one's story and yeah. one's actual decision making it because that, that, that was just, I just kept coming back to. Yeah, no, it's I think you put it really well. This is something that both father and son suffer from. It's partly a kind of stubbornness that really got in the way of, of uh, what Joe Jr. W was able to accomplish even in his short life. And so in that instance, in 1940, um, all kinds of people, including people from the administration, 
are saying, look, you really need to endorse uh, President Roosevelt for another term. Come on. Think about what's best for your own future. He's 27, what... 28. That, that's the age here. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, exactly. And so he's um, he is um, no, he's at this point about uh, 20. Yeah, 25, uh, roughly about 25, I guess, in age. Um, but uh, think about what's best for you. Think about what's best for the party, for this president. And he stubbornly resists doing this. And I think it's, as you point out, it's a real sign of who this person is. More troublingly, I think, is another, um, something else that he shares with his father, which is a, a, an admiration for Nazi Germany. Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily, a, a, in fact, I would not say a love for Nazi ideology, um, or a desire to see the same kind of ideology in the United States, but a admiration for what Hitler was able to do, the way he had revitalized, according to them, German society, uh, the way he had cleaned things up, uh, and they are skirting both of them very close to, um, I know, sometimes crossing over the line to some deeply troubling uh, assertions about what the Germans are up to and are willing in both instances to put this in writing, not just in letters to one another, but in letters to friends, to associates. And I suggest in the book, uh, when I write a little bit about um, the counterfactual, what if Joe Jr. had survived, would he have gone on to political greatness? I think one of the reasons there's re one should be skeptical about this is in part his personality traits, but also um, information that I think would have come to light before too much longer about some of the things he said about developments in the 30s. And then finally, of course, we need to comment on their deep and um, abiding isolationism. Both father and son feel strongly up until Pearl Harbor. And in the case of the father, even after Pearl Harbor, that the United States should steer clear of the war, should not become a belligerent. This is not our war to fight. This is up to the Europeans to do for themselves. We shouldn't do this. That I think is a problem for any political aspirations that Joe Jr. might have. So many things I want to hit there. And people are noticing that we're not spending as much time on JFK here. But my actual, once again, takeaway here is that it's this debate within the family that's actually so useful. So, so two things. One, and this takes us to the present day, a clear takeaway from this discourse around did people in the West overestimate Putin specifically? Mm. It seems Kerber is a longstanding instinct in democratic societies within certain personalities to overestimate the power of authoritarian regimes led by quote unquote great men. So if you, and once again, this is what, this is why it's fascinating that, and a quick, thing, quick, quick side note, total tangent. It must be so frustrating if you as a historian to just have access to all this writing and just know that future generations of historians are not going to be able to write about what people were thinking actively in the same way, because you're reading Joe Jr.'s letters back home when he's traveling, letters back home when he's traveling Europe, and you're shocked by kind of how superficial his analysis is too. So it's very, it's very, it's very, the way I'll put it for listeners, it's as if someone basically went to Europe and just, when well, he's reading us, he basically is like, whoa, look at the Germans. They're revitalized. They're strong. He's basically just, it's as if someone watched RT today. And then just wrote it down as, wow, this is this Russia. Yeah. They're, 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 they're strong. They've revitalized against the decadent West. And I don't say I want to be Russian, but there's really something there. And if, as we now know, post-World War II, when you're looking at his specific claims about Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, it was all bunk. He yeah. just uncritically was just so into the idea of these powerful. It, it, so can you just speak, what about their personalities? Yeah. And this is a present day issue too. What, what, what attracts certain people? I don't want you to be a psychologist, but th yeah. I just kept thinking like, wow, like what, what, what drives that? Yeah. Oh, it's such a good question. I don't know that I have a good answer in part because I am not a psychologist either. Um, I've thought long and hard about this. What I can say is that it's precisely as you say. So if we, if we look at Ambassador Kennedy, 1938 to 1940, so he's there at a key moment. 
and the constant overestimation um, of what the Germans are going to be able to do and a, and a kind of corresponding underestimation of what the Allies can accomplish is just a kind of drumbeat in his assessments back to the White House, but also to various associates. He's not very discreet about what he says and, and to whom he says it. Uh, the Germans are going to win. We might as well face this. There's really nothing we can do. We, the United States, need to focus on just the sort of fortress America notion. We're going to defend our homeland. Um, it is a, I, I don't have, that's not an answer to your question. It is a, a superficial tendency that both Joe, both of the Joes, Joe Sr. and Joe Jr. have to not think beyond what they're told in a sense, to trust what the doomsayers are saying about uh, what, the, what the West can do. Joe Sr. is deeply fearful of losing his fortune. So part of his motivation is making sure I keep my, my money for my family. Uh, and if this war goes on too much longer, I might lose it all. And therefore, we've got to make a deal with, uh, with Hitler on any terms that we can is basically his position. But that's uh, that's not really an answer to your question. What? So I'm. I, I guess I can't give um, you. It's, a I'm good just. Sense I'm getting at a notion. I, I, once again, there, there is no answer. I just think it's. Well, it's it's, it's something. It's something someone should guide oneself against. Is, yeah, is, the, way think, that, is the way that I'd put it. Uh, yeah, and I think I think maybe one one additional point to be made here, and, and this is something that Jack had, and maybe this is also something one can take away for today. Jack understood in a way that the older two didn't, that his brother did not and his father did not, uh, understood the importance of, of uh, going deeper, of really thinking through this, trying to be two or three steps ahead, having a, a better historical sensibility. He, had, he was much more interested in history than either his father or his brother. So he knew how great powers operated and he knew how sometimes they overreached. Uh, and he knew that democracy for all of its flaws, this is one reason he was interested in Churchill. Fascinating little side bit here is, is young Jack's fascination with Churchill, that democracies, when they put their minds to this and when they really bring everything to bear, can hold their own and in fact can prevail. This is something that I th think he comes to realize, especially over the course of his senior year at Harvard, 1939 to 40, as he's working on his senior thesis. So there's that element that I think both, both father and older brother lacked and it had huge consequences. I think my other critique of the two of them, and this very much comes through the book, is this idea that they overly personalize essentially everything. I, I like the way you described the really good takeaway from JFK here about like the bigger idea. Th th there's, there's for, for, for both of them, it does not seem as if there is any bigger idea in the sense that I'm, I'm, a, I'm more internationalist, I'm not an isolationist, but like I understand it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate thought process. The arguments, especially when they're happening are not quite clear. I 100% understand where people are coming from. But in both cases, their isolationism, as you were putting, is not coming from what I would say a deep understanding of history. And once again, we have their writings on this, so we know this. This isn't coming from a deep understanding of history. It's not coming from a rigorous thought process. It's coming from, in the case of Joe Sr., money, but also, to your point, fam familial concern. Oh, yeah. I do not want Joe, Jack, Bobby's too young, but directionally there. I do not want my sons to die in a European war. And with okay. Joe Jr., it's very much, you get the sense that if that if his father were a internationalist leader joined to the hip with FDR, Joe Jr. would have held entirely different positions. So, so in both cases, it's a real failure to take themselves out of a situation they still could have arrived where they arrived, right? So there is still a world where Joe Jr. is, is addressing America first um, rallies in Boston. There is still a world where Joe, Ju where Joe yeah. Sr. essentially destroys his career over a disagreement with, with FDR, but they got there through personal means. And that's what the problem is. Yeah, I, I, I think that's perfectly put. There is a, uh, a, 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 an inability to, to look at a situation dispassionately 
which Jack Kennedy had. He showed it here as a young man. I think he would show it in the White House and a disinclination to personalize, which I think when he becomes president, and I'm writing about this right now in volume two of the biography. So I'm hard at work now in the second volume, which will include the presidency. But at various points, this refusal to personalize important policy issues I think was highly consequential, maybe nowhere more so than with respect to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I've thought a lot in the last few days and spoken to some reporters in the last few days about how Kennedy handled the missile crisis versus how Joe Biden is now confronting the Ukraine crisis. And uh, I think an important mark in JFK's failure, uh, in favor is that he insisted on not personalizing the, the missile crisis and, and more important, being empathetic in the sense that he said to his advisors, we need to see things from Nikita Khrushchev, who was then the Soviet leader, Khrushchev's perspective. How does he see, see things? What can he get out of this if we have some kind of political solution to the missile crisis? He's got to be able to go back to his Kremlin colleagues with something. So that ability is there in Kennedy in JFK's life. And I think, as you say, his brother and his father lack it um, because of this, this uh, chronic uh, tendency to personalize. Uh, I think you put it really well. well. Well, here's another problem though. And once again, I'm editing this podcast in my head as we have this conversation. This is so much gonna be about um, his father and, and, and his brother, but that's okay. Let's focus on this word empathy, though, mm. because if anything, though, another way of articulating Joe Sr. and Joe Jr. is that they're overly empathetic towards Hitler and to Mussolini. They, 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 they are overly understanding. They are, and once again, it's important, but here's a better way to put it this way. Like how, how does one engage in empathy to the maximally useful degree without turning that empathy into an unhelpful neutrality oftentimes. Because it seems at various points of time, especially before World War II, Joe Sr. especially doesn't seem inclined to choose a side between the, Brit, between the Brits and the Germans. He really looks at the situation and says, look, here's the way the Germans feel, here's the way the British feel, I am in between these two things. When I do not think on a personal or even a policy or political level, that empathy, quote unquote, served him well. Yeah, yeah it's an interesting point. Uh, I, I think you could on some level. I, I'm not sure I've thought of that as being a, 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 a kind of signature of an empathetic understanding of the choices that confront U.S. policymakers in this period. But I think, I think you could say that, that he is able to put himself on some level into the, into the shoes of uh, the Japanese in the Far East, the Italians and the Germans in Europe, and then make his choices uh, accordingly. Um, so maybe what's going on there is there's a different kind of a shortcoming that uh, he's not able to go beyond trying to see on some level how things look from, from the respective sides uh, not able to consider what the implications would be of uh, Germany controlling all of Europe and then perhaps setting its side, uh, sights on the rest of the world. So if you've got Germany running rampant in, in Central and Eastern Europe and then looking beyond, and the Japanese also in control in the, in the Far East, what that would mean, not taking that extra step. So maybe it's a kind of myopic, uh, empathy that he has and that his his older son has, whereas Jack is able to look two or three steps ahead uh, and then to consider again what democracy brings for all of its flaws, as we said earlier. I think he understands, and you see this in, even in some of his course papers, that is to say when JFK is here at Harvard, he's able to see that the, de the demographic form of government can galvanize people, can bring people to a cause and cause them to, to, to commit to it uh, that will pay dividends in the future. Again, something that the, the, that the older two don't even think about.
I don't know. That's you raise a yeah. really interesting point. Well, I'm realizing you kind of gave the answer earlier when you pointed out that a key thing for JFK is he's still rooted in something. He's rooted in history. He's rooted in a greater idea. And once one is rooted, empathy becomes much more viable to style of situation. So one can be, one could ask oneself, well, you know, the Germans were for, were unfairly treated during the Treaty of Versailles. There are these controversies in Central Europe. We are the United States. We are separated from Europe, obviously by an ocean, but also certain foreign policy traditions. How do we navigate that? One could answer those questions in different directions, but when one is not rooted in something beyond the personal and even not just your familiar, but your ambition, that's where the trouble comes in. So let's, let's get to JFK specifically then. So, um, so two things to start here then. So one, we're up to the point where Joseph Kennedy Sr. is ambassador to Great Britain at a time yeah. when that position, not that position doesn't matter today, but it really mattered then. Like this, this really, this pre-collapse of the British Empire, this right. is a truly, this is the most important ambassadorship today yeah. Uh, yeah. At, at, the, at the time. So JFK enters the story. What events is he reacting to? How is his thinking developing? What's been the last bit on this? Well, this is this is this is an absolutely key period uh, for him, as it is for his father and for Joe Jr. Again, 1938 to 40. So let's think about this. 1938, the war clouds are beginning to gather. Uh, this is not too long before the Munich uh, Agreement uh, that that gives uh, part of Czechoslovakia to the to, to the Germans. Very important sort of marker on the road to war. That's when Joe. Senior is arriving as ambassador, uh, and Jack is a uh, a junior in, uh, in Harvard College. His brother's about to graduate, so the timing of this is just extraordinary. And Jack is observing all of this. Here's, I think, how we can summarize it. I think in his first couple of years at Harvard, uh, he is inclined toward his father's position, a kind of vaguely articulated by that point uh, isolationist position. I don't think he's really inclined to go against what his father is beginning to um, argue. But something interesting happens, which is that I think as a result of his travels, he travels extensively, first in 37 with his good friend Lem Billings, but especially this trip in the first half of 1939, it's a kind of semester abroad uh, that he has where he travels all over Europe because his, um, his father basically paves the way for him, makes connections so that he can go to these capitals, meet with interesting people. And he's beginning to take mental notes. He's digesting what he sees, partly as a result of that trip and partly as a result of his professors at Harvard, who tend to be much more interventionist than the student body. It turns out that Harvard students were deeply isolationist, including the Crimson, which is the campus newspaper in, in, in its editorials. But I think in the course of especially the senior year, JFK decides isolationism is an untenable position for the United States in this period. Meaning, at the very least, we should back the British to the hilt. Uh, and we also, I think he begins to see in 1940 after graduation, after he publishes his book, which is called Why England Slept, his, a revision of his senior thesis, he begins to say we might even have to ultimately intervene to stop both the Japanese and the Germans. So he's completely now moved apart from his father. This is a really interesting thing. And I, I, I will say this, I give the father credit. He never insisted, either with Jack or anybody else, that the kids had to follow his line on any of this. Makes it more all the more interesting why Joe Jr. did so, but he didn't insist on them doing this. He and Jack are now I would say fundamentally at odds on what should be the U.S. posture toward toward world affairs. You know, I'm something I'm curious about here. Um, this this Atlantic article goes around every few, every few years where it specifically cites how terrible JFK's admission essay to Harvard was. It's basically like I'm not going to do the accent, but I'd like very much to attend Harvard College. People, <laughs> listeners, should look. It's 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 a travesty of how pre meritocracy. Things just were very not great. Let's just say say it that. But but no but, question. Yeah. but, but the, and then once again, also his his grades are once again mediocre. Yeah. Um, 
even like today, he would not have been able to get into Harvard, even with the pedigree he had, he would have had to go to, you know, a, a second tier, excellent rich person school, but not but a second tier <laughs> one, nonetheless. But this process also worked. And I, 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 so once again, I'm just thinking about this where I'm thinking, and I'm sure you know this discourse, you know, Michael Sandel, all these people, there's deep dissatisfaction with the meritocracy right now. Um, just like this very clear, like this isn't working. We don't like our leadership class. Yet JFK come up, came up through this very unfair, very privileged system. He's able to skate by, but it kind of worked for him. Mm-hmm. And actually, if you actually think about the experience you're describing, his college experience was incredible. Like, and this isn't just like a, I wish I went to Harvard thing. Mm-hmm. His, his like actual ability to take college, to think and yeah. develop and form himself. I was just like, man, like, I wish I had that. So can you just speak to like, once again, you're at Harvard now. It, it seems like something, it seems like we either aren't like selecting for certain features that are basically important. Just, I don't know. I've just always thought this. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's true. I've thought about the same thing. Uh, and I've thought about, as you say, the application essay it wasn't even really an essay. It was handwritten. <laughs> a statement. It was a few sentences. <laughs> And as I note in the book, it really speaks more to a desire to be part of a certain sector of society than it was about sort of intellectual attainment. So he was not particularly serious. He had tried Princeton for a year, got sick, withdrew, and then came to Harvard, which is where his father had wanted him to go all along. Quick interruption. I think your use of the word tried Princeton also speaks to, and seriously, it, it actually, because once again, I'm trying to help people understand the mentality, that actually speaks to a difference between that, between then yeah. and now. No one would say tried yeah. no any one institution said. like this. Yeah. So I've fallen into, I, I've, I've become too immersed in the time <laughs> about which I'm writing. Uh, no, a good, a good, a good catch. Um, I think, I think as you put it, I forget, I, I can't recall your exact words, but this experience just works for him in a way that I think is, is quite stunning. And I hope, even though the circumstances are really different, that today's students who I teach at this very same institution um, and who come here through a very different process, where they have worked hard, you know, since grade school in many cases, but nevertheless can have the kind of, I guess it's fair to say, awakening that he has, because what happens, especially beginning a little bit in sophomore year, but especially junior and senior year, uh, he begins to take this more seriously. He still likes to have a good time. He still dreams of, of, of gridiron, of, of football, football glory, which he never uh, attains. Uh, so he's still very much a college kid in many ways, maybe not that different from today's students, Mm -hmm. but, but comes to see, comes to have an interest in ideas, uh, an interest in uh, how the world works, um, chooses government as his major, or as we call it here, concentration and, uh, develops a kind of intellectual curiosity, maybe for lack of a better word, that I think his brother lacks, to, at least to a degree, and that t- ends up serving him really well. I'm not sure that quite gets at what you're what you're wanting to. to, to yeah, once again, there's no, with most of these questions, there's no solution. There's just a dynamic of, it's a dynamic of thinking about like the contradictions and the differences between today's world. So last two things for this episode. So one, we're in this interesting period where there's this broad reassessment of the appeasement period. Yeah. Um, so everything from like the popular, so you have the, the Munich film um, yeah. on you know uh, Netflix to a lot of, I think we would recognize we maybe went a little too hard on Winston Churchill um, in terms of the hag- hagiographies. So people are basically saying, hey, like, is there much more to the challenges yeah. and the problems that Wood Chamberlain had? And as you point out in the book, in some ways, JFK really actually anticipates a lot of today's discourse in, in why England slept um, in a way that people probably undercount relative to the story of, oh, the book was only a success because his father bought him the book for it and all those different bits. So can you actually speak to what his argument was in why England slept? Yeah, so this is a, a thesis that um, looks at Britain in the interwar period and in, with particular emphasis on the 1930s. And, he, and there's a question at the heart of the thesis, which is why was England so underprepared 
unprepared or underprepared for what came um, beginning, obviously, in a, in a real way in 1939. That's the question here. And it's a good question. By the way, I suggest in the book, in my book, that um, uh, he was very much cutting edge in wanting to address this. There were very few books at the time that looked at this because it was so close. And for the British, it was too close in a different sense. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, it's a remarkable work in that sense. I also conclude that this is Kennedy's own work uh, rather than you know, something that was written by somebody else. I think this was very much his own thesis. He had help, very important help that maybe other students didn't have in Harvard College. His father, after all, is the ambassador in England. So he gets access to very various materials that others wouldn't have, but it's his, his own work. He concludes, and I think this is pretty interesting and it goes to your question, that um, we should have at least some sympathy for Prime Minister Baldwin uh, and then his successor uh, and then uh, Neville Chamberlain because of the pressure that they were under, which is to say that public opinion still so scarred from the First World War and from all the deaths in the trenches uh, wants peace almost at any cost and that any leader who pushes hard for a more interventionist posture against the Germans is going to pay for it. And so it becomes a question of, do I do what's right? What I think is right for Britain? Uh, and how, if so, how do I square, square that with what's best for my political, my, my sort of um, crass political um, future, my, 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 fu my political ambitions? And so Kennedy grapples with this, interestingly enough, and there's so much we could say about this, um, but in revising the thesis for publication, and he does that within just a few weeks because he graduates in 1940 in the spring, just as France is falling and the book appears just a few weeks later. But in revising it for publication, he uh, is a little harsher on Chamberlain. He makes it, makes it clear that this appeasement policy failed and it should have been perceived to have failed uh, at the time. And he's a little bit more, he adds a few words of sympathy to Churchill, who's now become the leader just as mm -hmm. he's doing this revising. So there's an interesting shift. But I do believe, to go back to Joe Sr. for a minute, I do believe, and I suggested that this in the book, that it's a, a kind of implicit rebuke, the thesis that is, of his father's position, of his older brother's position. And that too makes it in historical terms, a pretty interesting document. So to wrap the episode, the theme of this has essentially been how do how does one think through momentous world events mm. as they go on? So like that's the resonance. I think people should take what we're discussing here and apply it to how they're thinking about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But an uh, implicit thing we basically point out that the episode is Joe Jr. and Joe Sr.'s decisions and thought process leads them to failure in the case of Joe Sr., and to a certain degree, not just death in the case of Joe Jr., but to your point that there's actually a strong case to be made, that even should he have not gone on the suicide mission, he never would have achieved the yeah. ambitions he had. So can you just end, to tie it, to, just basically yeah. tie, the, tie the knot on both of their stories yeah. to finish up? Yeah, I think I, think I can do that. I think that uh, Joe Sr.'s political prospects were shattered forever. Uh, by his doom and gloom uh, assessments about what the United States could achieve and what the Allies could achieve, that spread and became public knowledge. I think it killed any prospects that he might have had down the line to perhaps be president himself. And he then had to transfer his ambitions to his sons, which he did. Um, and Joe Jr. was guilty by association. I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about today is the degree to which a sibling rivalry dominated in some ways, especially Joe Jr.'s thinking. As his younger brother begins to have a claim, publishes his senior thesis, which becomes a minor bestseller, has this heroic uh, intervention or episode in the South Pacific in 1943. This really gnaws at Joe Jr. And it's clear, and I present evidence for this in the book, that he's He's deeply hurt by this uh, and 
I think one of the reasons, I can't really prove this, but one of the reasons why he volunteers for that final suicide mission is because he's determined to, if not outdo his younger brother, who was the slacker and he was never as serious as I was. He didn't work as hard as I did. What the heck has happened here? If not outdo that younger brother, at least match his exploits. He needed to have some kind of similar experience himself, volunteers for this mission that kills him in 1944. Um, and it's a, it's a tragic, obviously terrible ending to this story that these two um, brothers experience this. Uh, and of course, for history, what matters here is that the father now says in so many words, Jack, you know, the mantle is now yours. And the final thing I want to say here is that we should not therefore assume, as some historians and biographers have done, that it's all Joe Sr. who decides that Jack is now going to become a political candidate. Jack Kennedy, I think, substantially decides that for his own reasons. He has a deep interest in politics, uh, deeper than his brother's. Uh, an understanding of this, I think he was going to go there in any case, but he certainly now has his father's encouragement. And that, um, you know, that sends him on his way. Yeah, I know. The thing I'll wrap on is I, when you're reading this very little, I, I have very little sympathy. To, I, I, I understand where Joe Sr. is coming from, but the, the story of Joe Jr. just really, it's just such a sad story. Yeah. Um, and once again, just to add to the list of failures here, I'm not just trying to sort of besmirch someone who died heroically, obviously, but he just was unable to reconcile himself to how unfair life can be sometimes. Because the key thing is JFK becomes famous. He gets his Life magazine cover because of PT-109, something that Joe Jr. actually hints at in one of the letters you showcase is that PT-109 incident happened because in certain in certain respects, JFK was a deficient PT boat commander. Um, what happened, aka his PT boat getting sliced in half by a Japanese destroyer, A, didn't happen throughout the rest of the war in either, any other context. Uh, so for if you're Joe Jr., you're thinking, wait, I'm a naval aviator flying, flying these incredibly dangerous missions. I'm good at my job, all these different bits. And then to add to the unfairness of the situation, my brother, through his incompetence, and then once again, now he's not doubting the post-crash heroism, but yeah. if I were if I were flying a B-24 and I pulled something like this, I wouldn't be a hero. It's yeah. it's he just he just couldn't he couldn't let that go. And I think that's just another, and this is gonna apply to life in general beyond just like politics, just like sometimes life at a narrative level is not unfair is unfair. Yeah. And there's only so much you can do to reshape the universe to the direction you want. Well, and, and I'll just say this too. Just I think you're exactly right. And this thing that's remarkable about this is that we have evidence. It's not that we have to, you know, speculate about this. In other words, there's a particular moment after PT-109 uh, when the word has gotten out that Jack survived. It's been covered in the press. And Joe Jr. does not write to the family. Um, and and at, uh, after a few days, the father writes to Joe Jr. and says, why have we not heard from you about Jack's uh, incredible survival? And he offers a response that's sort of measured, but it's so clear that, of course, he's happy that his brother is alive. But that grudging, uh, the, the degree to which it's grudging, and you know, why is this guy being all over the front pages now? Why is he being depicted as a hero, given that he allowed his PT boat to be sliced in half? It's right there. It's right there on the page. And as you say, um, a very sad story, that, that particular story. Well, we'll end there, but um, Fred would love to have you back on when volume two yeah. comes out. I hope, I hope COVID hasn't, um, I think you had an interview where you said it, this has essentially delayed your research process um, to a certain degree, um, but I hope, um, I hope that continues to go well and thank you for coming on the show. I'm, I'm pressing ahead. I'm not letting um, temporary uh, closure of archives uh, slow me down too much. It's been a pleasure to be on with you and I look forward to a future conversation.